said. There was no reply. Et say, I tried in chi. Still, she was quiet. She looked frustrated with herself for not being able to reply. She gave a shy smile to show she did not intend to be rude and lowered her large metal bow. I smiled back and suddenly, language did not seem important. It was as if we knew each other already. Abena, stop wasting time and bring her inside. My aunt called from inside the shop. She is here to carry things, not to chat with you. Hey, small girl, brah. She finished off brusquely, ordering the girl inside with the curl of her fingers. The girl hurried in, carrying her oversized metal bow before her and placed it at Aunt Lydia's feet. As she bent down, I could see that her eye was caught by the gleaming French manicure on Auntie's long pointed toenails. With eyes still lowered, she collected bag and shopping bags from the fat customer with the eight rings on her fingers and arranged them deftly inside her bowl. This was the awkward moment because she needed help but did not know how to ask for it. I rushed over and grabbed the rim of the bowl to help lift it onto her head. We struggled a bit as it tipped precariously in my direction. Then it was up, still snugly on the flattened part on her head, a faded scarf rolled into a cloth snail shell. As we did this, a new customer entered the shop, immaculate in a white lace anago wrapper and a top with a red and gold gale on her head. Before I go on with the story, let me explain these two terms, anago and gale. Anago is a term popularly used by Ghanaians, especially the Ghan and Dames and the Airways, for Yoruba or generally Nigerian people. By extension, it is also applied to a common Nigerian woman's outfit, featuring a loose, long sleeve top and a wrapper clothes tied around the waist. Gele is a term in the Yoruba language as a stiff, on its scarf, folded and tied into an elaborate headdress, most common in Nigeria. Now, going on from where we stopped. It was so gorgeously folded and tied that I resolved there and then to go to the shop next door and beg the Nigerian lady to teach me how to do it. Auntie was mesmerized too, so I took advantage and slipped out, following the girl with a huge bowl on her head. I could not believe how straight and fast she walked with that weight on her head. I imagined that if we had put it on my head instead, my whole neck would have been pushed down into my chest and my knees would have collapsed into my feet. We walked in single file. Auntie's customer, who had now become the girls, leading the way towards her car. The girl following and me on scene bringing up the rear. I did not really know why I was following. I didn't think about that till later. A few hours later and then many years later. A few hours later, I thought I had probably done it because I was getting bored spending all day every day at auntie's shop. Mommy had traveled to London to have a baby and daddy was busy with work and auntie Lydia had offered to have me for the long vacation. I liked auntie Lydia but I was a bit scared of her and it would have been rude to say no. But also, I was looking forward to spending time in her shop at Makola Market. Mommy hardly ever went to the market. She said it exhausted her, so she sent our house up every week instead. I had only been to Makola the few times she wanted to visit Auntie Lydia there. I found it fascinating, all the hustle and the bustle, the smells and the colors. One minute, you will be admiring secure lace fabric and the next, you would almost stumble over a tray of coiling within black snails. You would see granite paste in huge bowls enough to dive into. 
and substances you never knew existed, rolled into balls, cut into blocks, twisted into shapes that you wondered what on earth you were meant to do with them. Eat them, take a bath with them, build a house with them. Auntie Lydia's shop was one of the fanciest in Makola Market with air conditioning and brocade curtains. Oh yes, she was a proper market queen, my auntie. But the one thing that disappointed me about her shop was that she did not have a cash till. I had always longed to press the button on those machines like the uniformed shop assistants sitting in rows in the supermarkets, tapping their fingers so fast and so expectedly over the keys. No, Auntie just collected all the money, rather untidily, I thought, in the lower drawer of a desk. But it is still exciting to see all the pretty things in the shop and to be given the responsibility for serving customers. It made me feel quite grown up. Although I noticed the girls with a large metal bowl on their heads walking around in my first few days, I did not really pay them much attention until one came into our shop. That was when a customer made a large purchase. Abena, go outside and call us a kayayo, Auntie said. A kaya what? I asked. Auntie Lydia smiled. Hmm, your parents are making a brony out of you at that your American school, she said, glancing with a mixture of pride and embarrassment at her customer. Go and call me one of those girls carrying big bowls on their heads, she said, switching to tree in a deliberate manner she used whenever she was on a mission to rescue the Ghanaian in me. I stepped outside, blinking in the blazing sunshine and screwed up my eyes trying to spot one. It did not take long because she signaled pettily when she saw me scanning the stalls and alleys. I nodded and she marched briskly to the shop. I noticed them more after that but I never had the urge to talk to them until today. This one was different. She looked no older than me and it was the shy, slightly scared look in her eyes that made me notice her. And when I realized she didn't speak any language I knew, I was amazed and intrigued. How could she be working in Makola Market when she did not speak Chi or Ga or English? What did she speak? I wondered as I trailed her and her customer. Perhaps I'd find out when we reached the car park, but I did not. She just lowered her bowl and packed the goods into the madame's car boot for her. Then she accepted the coins with a tiny nod and put the empty bowl back on her head. The car sparked with a rich pro as she turned around. She saw me immediately and I knew she was not surprised although she had had no idea I was following her. She smiled the same smile. It was the second time and I noticed the same thing. That when she smiled at me, the lost look in her eyes disappeared. Perhaps that was what had made me follow her. I knew that Auntie would be wondering where I was and judging from the girl's grip on her bowl, she knew she should be looking for her next customer. But she just walked over to me as if we had an, an appointment. We looked at each other and I noticed that she had a fine line edged vertically in the middle of each cheek. I'm Abena, I said in Chi. I'm Faiza, she said in a language I would soon find out was called Dagbani. We did not speak each other's language but I heard her name and she heard mine. And I found out other things about her too, that day. Don't ask me how, but somehow she was just so easy to talk to. I guess we must have used some sign language and a few universal words that even she could understand. I don't know how to uh, explain it, but I found her easier to talk to than people with whom I could converse in two or three languages. She came from a place called Tolon in the northern region and she just arrived in Accra the day before. And she was 14 years old, like me. If you love this video, please subscribe like and comment you can also press the bell so that anytime when i do a new video you will come out to be the first to get it